world and locally here in Pennsylvania. And we are just blown away constantly by what God is doing through men and women who live normal, ordinary lives, but who fall in love with and worship and praise a God who is far greater than our greatest hopes and our wildest dreams. And we are just so honored to come and worship with you, to partner with you in ministry, and to stand together holding hands, praising the name of Jesus. And so today we're going to dive into the word here. Uh, a couple of things about myself. I'm a youth pastor here locally in the South Central PA region, uh, but it's such a pleasure to come and fellowship with the wonderful folks at Jesus Lord Ministries. Um, I apologize for, I got kind of a little wacky hairdo today. I don't know if you've ever sat, um, when it's cold outside, put a sweater or a jacket on, but wasn't a zip up. You had to just put it, slide it over your head. I did that and my hair still hasn't recovered. So I got sweater head going on today. So any, any of y'all out there who are like, man, this guy's got some terrible looking hair. It looks like he just rolled out of bed. Well, it's not entirely false, but the main reason why I got some serious sweater head going on. But despite this, I'm sure what God has in store for you today is going to come through loudly and clearly. In our journey in the month of November, just to further the process, further the conversation about our walk with God, we're going to dive into a somewhat familiar text. It's in 1 Kings chapter 3, and it involves one of the most complex, fascinating characters of the entire Old Testament. It involves Solomon. And the writer of 1 Kings writes, beginning at verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 3, says, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, Ask for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, wouldn't that be amazing if years down the road, when we're getting ready to pass from this life to the next, if our loved ones, if our family, our friends, even our enemies, even the people who said, hey, I, I didn't get them, I couldn't understand them, wouldn't it be amazing if that's what they use, those words, they use those words to describe us, that we are righteous, faithful, and upright. That's just, that's just a mind-blowing thought to begin here. But uh, Solomon continues, And you have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or even to number. That's just another example of how the God we serve keeps his promises. That's a promise he made to Abraham way back in Genesis 12. You're going to be the father of a nation greater than the stars in the sky. We see the promise just continue to come true here in 1 Kings 3. So give your servant Solomon a wise and discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for wisdom, and you did not ask for a long life, you did not ask for riches and wealth, or the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will have never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be anyone after you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for as well, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime 
you will have no equal amongst all the kings in all the lands. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as your father David did, I will give you a long and prosperous life. And then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. And he returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Covenant, and he sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowshiped offerings. And then he gave a feast for all his court. And as we're talking about our walk with God, we're, we have to ask ourselves that in this walk that we're taking, in the walks we take in life, walks always lead to a destination. They always lead to a finishing point. Never when we go out walking or hiking or we go on a journey do we ever say, we're just going to go and we're just going to just walk aimlessly. There's always an end point. There's always an end goal in mind. And our walk with Jesus has a very specific goal, both in the here and now and in the future. If we look at what's designed to happen in the present, it's a real simple simple thing to preach. It's a very simple thing to talk about. But to live out the faithfulness to God's word, to live out a desire to become more like Jesus every day, that's very difficult. That's very messy. That's not an easy thing to do. That's our goal in the present and our future destination in our walk with God is not just to walk aimlessly through this life, not just to fall for any passing fad, any passing thing, any new technology, any new goal, anything that comes along. But our goal in the journey is to be closer to God in the future than we are now, to be closer to God in the present than we were in the past, to look back a year from now and to say, I am this further along with Jesus. My heart loves Jesus more right in 2013 than it did in 2012. And I'm confident that my heart's going to love Jesus more in 2014 than it did in 2013. That's an incredible goal in our walk. And I think those listening, those connected with JIL, agree that our hope is as followers of Jesus is to live lives that are effective, to live lives that glorify Him, and to fall in love with Him more. But the question remains, though, how do you accomplish the goal? The goal's easy to preach about, but how do you do it? How do you do it? And I think 1 Kings 3 is on to something. It's not the whole answer. It's much more deep than that, much more broad than that. But I think it's going to get you in the right direction. The truth of 1 Kings 3, that the way you need to walk is in wisdom. That the foolishness of your youth, the foolishness of your days and your time before accepting the grace and love of Jesus Christ, those need to slowly fade into the distance as you pursue the path of wisdom. And we're looking at wisdom today. It's not a very flashy subject. It's not something that many preachers across America will talk about on a fairly regular basis. It's something that a lot of people will tell you as a young person. You need to be more wise. You need to make better decisions. But oftentimes, very rarely, will they take the time to follow up and say, here's how you do that. Here's how you go from being foolish and immature to being someone who makes good decisions, who lives life that's effective and meaningful and purposeful. And that's what, we're, that's what we're designed to do here today. We're designed to tell you today in this message, just to not finish the conversation, but to begin it, to say walking in wisdom is one of the big ways to further your walk with Jesus. And first and foremost, the book of Proverbs talks about this time and time and time again. We could share verse after verse about one of the first steps in the process of walking in wisdom. The book of Proverbs says you need to surround yourself with wise people. And that's not to say 
one of the things you might walk away is saying, Preacher, do you mean to tell me I have to get rid of all my non-Christian friends? Do you need, do you, you were telling me that if someone's immature, if they're young, if they're still developing, I can't associate with them. Well, that's not, that's not the case. That's not the case. You can associate, you can fellowship with them, but you need wise people in your life. You need people who have experience, who have wisdom, who some of them may have scars through poor decisions in the past, through mistakes they've made. You need people who take the knowledge and the education they have and they live it out. They have common sense. If all the leaders of this great world we live in surround themselves with councils and cabinets and parliament and great wise men and women to help them lead and govern effectively, shouldn't you as a follower of God, somebody whose goal is, is to see the kingdom of heaven continue to break into the here and now, shouldn't you, as someone whose goals are far greater than the rulers of this world, shouldn't you surround yourself with good and wise people? And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to listen to the advice of people who have walked the path you're on. It's not easy to hear probably the two most dreaded words in the English language, you're wrong. It takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of setting your ego aside and saying what's most important are not my feelings, most important is not the way people look at me. What's most important in my life is something, something greater, something far better that will go on after I leave this earth. And that is the mission of God. That is, that is your life drawing people closer to Jesus or is it pushing them further away? And surrounding yourself, and not only doing that, but also listening to wise men and women is a very important step in walking in wisdom. And one of the tough parts, though, in life as we walk, as we walk in wisdom is that Life is difficult, and it's very, very, very messy, and things happen that we try to explain to ourselves, we try to explain to non-believers, we try to walk with people on difficult roads, but the reality is, is that there's not ever going to be a way we can fully explain everything. Because if you could add everything in life, if you could rationalize it all out, if you could make sense of every difficult moment, every bump in the road, every scar, every injury, every hurt that your friends, your loved ones, your fellow Americans endure, if you could make sense of it all, you wouldn't need God. It's one of the most dangerous parts of our society today. Is we're a society that needs answers. We're a society that doesn't like to be stumped, doesn't like to be confused, likes to have knowledge, can access it instantly. But when something comes along and really messes us up, really hurts those that we care about, that causes us to do one of the most unthinkable things, that causes us to doubt either the goodness or power of God. And so we just want to share with you, we want to share with you in the gospel, in the gospel of John, John chapter 14, and we're going to share two, John, sorry, John chapter 10, I apologize. John chapter 10, 14 is coming. John chapter 10 is right in the middle of, on the waning part of Jesus' earthly ministry. 
The cross is on the horizon. The disciples have heard time and time again Jesus say, suffering's coming. Confusion's on the way. It's okay now, but it's going to get a whole lot worse later. The disciples have heard that. And Jesus comforts them, comforts them with these words right here. John, right in the middle of John chapter 10, beginning in verse 8, Jesus says, All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep never listened to them. I am the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out, and he will find pasture. The thief only comes to kill and destroy, but I have come so that you may have life and have life to the full. For I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus comforts us, comforts those right in the here and now, back then, and those right now, by saying, the life's going to be filled with difficult moments. You're not going to see the whole picture. You can only see in the moment a tiny snapshot of what just happened. But the amazing part is, and this is the part where wisdom really kicks in, where perspective is crucial. The incredible part is, is that God says, you see the present. You see just this tiny snapshot. I can see what's come before, what's happening all around you, and what's coming. I can see the whole picture. You see just a little tiny part. God's saying, hold on. I'm somebody who you might not fully understand, but I'm somebody who you know. I'm somebody who is good, will continue to do good. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to hold on to you. And God says, I'm going to make sure that no one, no matter what, alters the ending of your story. And that's an incredible part of wisdom. A lot of us get confused by the world and what's going on in the present. And someone who's wise, and someone who has fallen in love with wisdom and making good choices, will encourage you and say, the present's confusing. This world's a messed up place. But we serve a God who's far greater than the world. You just need to trust and have faith that God is good. And that's just an amazing truth, another crucial part of wisdom. We talked about how we need to surround ourselves with good people. We need to understand and see the whole picture. Number, um, our third area of wisdom, we want to walk in wisdom. We want to know God. Our third way to do that is to make sure that we're very, very careful about quick decisions. Make sure I find the book of James here. Here we go. Uh, we're the book of James here. And James 1.19 is an incredible verse. And I think a lot, of, a lot of us need to hold this verse close to us. This is a verse which, in my, hum my humble opinion, applies to many, many people. You need to write it on the, put it, stick it as a magnet on the refrigerator, put it on the dashboard of their car. You need to especially keep it in their office. Keep it wherever you find people or situations that just grate on you, that just provoke you and really cause your nerves and your blood to boil. This is James 1.19, a really great life verse. James writes, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. If you want to walk in wisdom, be very, very slow to get angry at people. If you want to walk in foolishness, if you want to look back at your life and say, my life's filled with regrets. I've said things and hurt people in ways which I'm so ashamed of. Be very quick then to get angry. Be very quick to say the first thing that comes into your mind. This verse is absolutely timeless because I realize more and more that human beings 
are some of the most infuriating things on the planet. They never fully live up to their potential. They get us upset at times. They just grate on our nerves. And it's very easy to say the very first thing that comes into you know, comes into your head to say, "Oh, that was stupid." What? Why would you? What, who would even think about doing that? It's very easy to do that. But James says, "What's most important is not always about being right." That's the truth of the verse. It's not always about having your way be supreme. What's most important is that relationship with another. If you want to hurt relationships, James is saying, be quick to speak and quick to get angry. We want to encourage you, as you continue your walk with Jesus, walking in wisdom, and as somebody who is falling in love with wisdom, being quick to listen and to think about why did that person act in that way? I've told them a million times not to do that. Why have they done it again? Why won't they just listen? What is going on with them? But I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to take some time out of my day to just encourage them no matter what. I'm, I'm going to listen. Because I'm sure that whatever's going on with them, they need a listening ear and an encouraging word. And so we just want to encourage those listening all around and abroad that wisdom is something in our society which folks aren't gravitating toward. Wisdom takes time. Wisdom takes effort. And we're living in a society, living in a day and an age where we often don't like both of those words. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. We just have one more, one more idea, one more way in truth where we as followers of Jesus, some who have it all together and some whose lives are feels like they're broken beyond repair. We as followers of Jesus want to keep walking with God, walking toward God. And wisdom, I believe, isn't the only step in the process, but I believe it's going to open the door and give you understanding to realize and know future steps in the process. I believe it's one of the, the most important early steps. Learning how to love wisdom and crave wisdom. And so as we near the end of our time together, it's an incredible journey. I hope and I pray that you'll keep each other, you'll keep me and this wonderful ministry in your prayers in the days and weeks ahead. Because one of the truths we, we know is that the evil one is sadly alive and well. But an amazing truth, which is far greater than that, is that we serve a God who's conquered everything and a God who continues to call every one of all languages, tribes, and tongues back to his name. And our final, our final thing to consider on this journey of wisdom, we first talked about you need to surround yourself with great people, with wise people. You need to understand that the present's confusing and that God sees the whole picture and that God is good and God loves you. You need to be very slow to get angry and slow to speak, but lend a quick ear. Our final step in the journey for today is you need to understand and always have the end in sight. When he was in the upper room with his disciples celebrating the Passover, just a few short hours later, he would be arrested, betrayed by somebody who he thought was a friend. He'd be denied by the same man who promised just a couple, just the previous chapter, to go to the cross with him. Jesus had a lot on his mind when he said these words. But he offers them as a comfort to me and to you 
to show us that the end is set, that the end of your story, of my story, the end of our time here as human beings on an earth that was created good but ultimately, sadly, fell to sin and disobedience. But the end of our time here is with God, praising God. It ends in life and not death. And that's what, that's what Jesus reminds us in John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Jesus encourages his disciples by saying, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are not a few, but there are many, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I am going there now to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas being confused, said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Today is a day where many of us celebrate that our brave service men and women sacrificed and gave their all so that we as the United States of America can be free. It's a day when there's a lot of empty chairs at dinner tables clear across the country. It's a day when a lot of folks will travel to cemeteries and they'll lay flowers on graves and they'll tell stories and remember someone brave in their life who went on before. But it's a day when we as the body of Christ can be the encouragement, can provide the hope to folks who are struggling today, we can remind all of them that our life, when it's found in Christ, does not end in separation, doesn't end in heartache, doesn't end in pain or death, but instead it ends in life. That we can show wisdom to to people who are down and out, to people who need encouragement, and remind them of the truth, that though your body is broken, though your life didn't turn out the way you had hoped or dreamed, though the expectations people had on you weren't fully lived out, weren't fully realized, the incredible thing is, is that God loves you no more or no less. God is still crazy about you, no matter what's happened, because God created you to be with him. And that's the end of the story. That's the hallelujah. That's the happily ever after. That no matter what, those who were found in Jesus Christ, the condemnation is gone. And wisdom reminds you of that. The world in its foolish ways sadly causes you to forget how good and how great God is. The world can very easily cause you to stumble and lose sight of the end of your story. We don't fully know how we're going to get there. We don't fully know or understand all that's going on in our life or all that God brings to our door. But we do know, no matter what, the end of our story ends in glory. 
It ends in grace, and it ends in love. And wisdom lived out, wisdom and perspective shown in the midst of trial, in the midst of hardship. It's one of the most amazing, God-honoring things I can think of as a follower of Jesus Christ. Christian evangelist and speaker Bob Lenz is based out of, I think it's Madison. He's based out of Wisconsin. I think it's Madison, Wisconsin. has an incredible ministry that reaches out to young people, and they go to high schools all across the country. They bring in bands and speakers at night, and every night Bob tells the salvation story because he knows that across this great country of ours, there are many young people who need to hear the incredible news that Jesus loves them. But Bob tells a story very, very often in his ministry, but it's a powerful story which shows you how amazing wisdom is and how God never loses sight of us. The story he reminds us of is when his incredible mother was near her deathbed. A woman had been struggling with cancer for years and years and years. And cancer had just crippled this poor lady's body. A woman who was once just beautiful, full of life and grace and energy, had been slowed down and been crippled by the devastating disease of cancer. And on her deathbed, when she was about to pass from this life to the life to come. Bob and his family were there. They were holding hands and encouraging her and praising Jesus for her incredible life. And one of the parishioners in her church, someone who is well familiar with her story, came up right as near, near the end. She had a few short hours to live and was just touched by her incredible faithfulness to God throughout her tough, difficult struggle with cancer. The parishioner asked her this question, have you ever been mad? Or have you ever doubted God throughout your fight with cancer? And Mrs. Lenz looked up at, looked up at this man and said, if I view my life based on my circumstances or my disease, I'd be absolutely furious and I would have lost my faith a long time ago. But if instead what I chose to do was to view my life based on the cross, based on the incredible love of God has for me and that God has shown me, what I've chosen to do is to see the goodness and greatness of God. I fully accept that God chose cancer to call me home. And that's a lot of our stories right now, that we don't fully understand what's happening in the present. The w world and the evil one and the foolishness that is all around us is telling us and trying to pull us away from the goodness and greatness of God. And Jesus reminds us time and time again that your story, the end is set, and it ends in glory. And our hope is, as we move into, slowly move into the holiday season in 2013, that you would encourage, you would take some time out of your busy schedule to both encourage somebody to walk in wisdom, to offer them good advice, encourage them to make good decisions, but also you would, as somebody who doesn't have all the answers, you would seek someone more wise than you for the days and the weeks ahead of your life as well. Let us continue to glorify God with everything we are, let us continue our walk with God. There's some amazing teaching, amazing preaching right around the corner. And above all, let us never lose sight that when we walk in wisdom,
the wisdom of Jesus Christ, we're going to walk closer to God and not farther away. Let's close our time in prayer. Lord God, in the midst of everything we are and everything we do, we're continually touched that your patience and your love far out see, far succeeds our sin and shortcomings. Help us as the body of Christ to continue to never lose sight of who you are. Help us to walk in wisdom. Be patient with us as we fall short time and time again. And Lord, above all, we ask and pray for on this Veterans Day, we pray for our men and women who are brave and serve our country. We ask that you keep them safe and strong. And we pray that you would shower your love and grace on those who have lost loved ones in the lines of service. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.